Uh, and so uh, the Bronx is home. Uh, the Bronx is uh, the anchor of everything that's happened for me. If any of you are involved in education, uh, you have heard of a book that Jonathan Kozel wrote called Savage and Equality Children in American Schools. Uh, that was my elementary school. Uh, I was actually there at the time. James Carter was my principal, PS 79. Went to 118 and then Dewitt Clinton High School. A lot of people may not realize Dewitt Clinton High School um, has the largest alumni association of any high school in the world. Uh, because when Clinton was all boys um, during wartime, it was up to 11,000 students at the time. Uh, so <coughs> County Cullen, James Baldwin, Ralph Lauren, Congressman Rangel, uh, uh, Nate Tiny Archibald, all were alumni of, of Clinton. Uh, I left Clinton and went to Northwestern University to study journalism, so we got a lot of you know communication love going right here. You know, I, I know I'm not a marketer. What'd you say? You with product placement? That's what you said earlier. Okay, you know, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get on that as well. Uh, and in, in 2001 was the second moment uh, of reflection. I was coming back from Chicago to New York, and I fell asleep at the wheel. And I was with one of my good friends, Eric Gretsch. We were coming back. We were growing through the hills of Pennsylvania. And other than the hands of God, the only reason we didn't go over the cliff was the amount of luggage we had in the car. Amen. And six days before that, I wrote out something to myself, not realizing uh, the impact that it would have. Uh, and it said, Dear God, let today be my greatest day, greater than the great day I had a day before. But my goal has not been met unless tomorrow is the greatest of them all. And, and that has, has stood with me. Uh, and when you have moments like that, you quickly realize that no day is promised. Uh, at all, and you have to really reflect on, on what you're doing. And so for me, my mom always told me, as did my dad and everyone around me, that I was going to be one of three things in life. I either was going to be a preacher, I was going to be in communications, I was going to be in politics. Uh, ironically <laughs> enough, I became all three, right? Uh, so I've actually been preaching for 20 years. Uh, I'm a lay minister in United Methodist Church and the AME Church uh, itself. Our home church is Calvary United Methodist Church in the Bronx. Uh, my career before politics was in journalism. I was a sports producer in Chicago at Comcast Sports. Uh, but politics what always drove me. I just I genuinely feel there is no more comprehensive way you can help someone than do public service. Because when you really take the time to think about it, there is literally nothing you can do from the moment you are born to the moment you get called on home that is not impacted by some form of policy. Literally nothing that you do in your life that is not impacted by some form of policy. Whether it be the clothes you have on, the food that you eat, the, the cars that you're in, the houses that you have, whatever it may be, something impacted that. And so for me, it's important that people of color are part of that process. I don't want folks dictating our future and dictating our destiny. I wanted to be a part of how we transform that, that discourse. And so I made the decision to run. A few of us were talking earlier about uh, when, when you're young and you decide to pursue your dreams collectively, uh, I was told to wait my turn. I'm sure no one in this room has ever been told to wait your turn, right? That never happens, right? You, you never get told wait your turn if you are talented and you're a person of color. That never happens, right? <laughs> and uh, I, I had a challenging race. We had a six-way race, but we won our race, unfortunately, uh, by 13 points in the primary and then by about 80 points in the general election. Uh, and, and because we put in the work. You know, uh, Mayor of Atlanta, Kasim Reed, told me a few years ago, uh, you have to enjoy the grind. Right? If, if, if you don't, then don't be involved in any of this. You know, you have to really be excited about the work that you put in. And, and for me, this all came together uh, in 2005. I was working for my TV station that I mentioned, and I started interning for a state senator, and my TV station did not know I was interning. I was interning for a gentleman named Jeff Schoenberg. Woman walked in, she said, if you don't help me, I'm going to lose my home in a week. Uh, which hit home. My mama was homeless in Jamaica. Uh, many times we sold dinners on Saturday afternoons here in the Bronx to pay for our rent. And so when she walked in, you, you, it, it, there was not a theoretical conversation. That was, I was seeing my family. Uh, I was seeing what was happening there. We helped her keep her home. She came back, she said thank you. That was the turning point for me to decide to go into politics full time. Uh, and was fortunate to get accepted into the Yes We Can tro program in 2006, which led to me being connected to President Obama for about seven plus years. So I was on both campaigns. I was in Iowa. I did all the constituency organizing in Iowa. And some folks have been asking me about it. I'm happy to talk about the presidential elections. I am fascinated about the whole process. You should not sleep on Donald Trump right now. I will tell you why in a little bit, and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, and so, uh, and I did the first campaign. I did eight states over 20 months. I did the inauguration. I oversaw all the outreach for the King family to the inauguration. And then went to the White House for two and a half years. 
where my portfolio was all the state and local outreach for elected officials, uh, African American and minority business outreach. Uh, where we launched the Urban Entrepreneurship Program, which is why minority women-owned businesses are something I'm so passionate about. It is what drives me, and I'll talk about that uh, momentarily. Uh, I left the, the White House because I saw all the noise that was happening, and I refused to allow President Obama to be a one-term president. And David Pluff said to me, you will never forgive yourself if you're sitting here and we lose. And, and I left the next day, and I went to Chicago to be one of the national deputy directors for the re-election campaign. Uh, but then it was time to come home. Uh, and, and I just genuinely felt, what's the purpose of all of this if you don't go home? Uh, and so I came back home in 2013 full time and, and had the chance to help manage a race and do some consulting here. Uh, we've been doing consulting. I have my own consulting firm, Atlas Strategy Group, and we've been doing work not just nationally but internationally in a whole host of different manners, helping MWBs get to larger scale and also political campaigns as well. Uh, and in 2014, it was time to go. Uh, it was time to run. Uh, I saw what was happening here in New York. Uh, I saw an opportunity. I was, I, I was encouraged to run. And I said, you know, why not? You know, what, what's the point of preparing if you're not going to make that leap? So we won, fortunately. And we took office December 15th of 2014. Uh, and then this last year has been a very active year for us collectively. So for those of us uh, who may not know anything about what goes on in New York politics, a very quick crash course. There are 19.4 million people that live in the state of New York. There are only 150 people that represent you in the State Assembly and 63 that represent you in the State Senate. So again, process that. 19.4 million people live in the state of New York, 213 people make your laws. I'm one of, I'm one of those people that has that ability. That's it. That's it. Just process that. You know. uh, I have 139,000 people in our Assembly District. Our district is the 79th Assembly District. We represent the South Bronx. Here's a reason why you should care about our district. We go from 153rd in Melrose to 183rd in Southern Boulevard. We are the most diverse assembly district in the nation. In the nation. We have the largest West African population outside of West Africa in the world. We are 53% Latino. We are 41% African American. We have 94 schools, $24,000 in terms of our area median income collectively. Our largest employer is Bronx Lebanon Hospital, but our second largest employer is Golden Crust. <laughs> Yard, yard, man, yard. It was Aki and Selfish, but no, no, we left, we left. So we have all these things that are all intertwined. We've been talking about the ginger drink, which is a phenomenal drink. Did you bring any tonight? Yeah, we already going across yeah. right now. Okay, you're going across now. That ginger drink is serious, right there. You know, we gonna get that into the district, but we are gonna talk about that separately. Right? So, right, right. There we go. So, um, no pressure publicly. There's a video camera on. Watch yourself right now. I'm just saying. But so what, what we decided to do was focus on a vision that people can be excited about. And uh, I am a person of faith, but I'm, I'm going to say this for a second. Our vision is three, two, one. Uh, and the reason why I'm doing this is when I grabbed the coat check, they gave me three, two, one, which showed me that this was going to be a powerful night, right? Of all the things that it would have been, and especially that has never happened before. Three stands for the three E's of what my vision is of economic development, education, and equality for all. Two are for the two paths on how we make that happen of minority women-owned businesses getting the opportunity to grow and get access to capital contracting because when they are stronger, you can hire more people. And then a career-oriented education so that our young people can go from the cradle to the career because what's the point of graduating if you can't get a job? And then one is how do we transform the South Bronx to make it the urban metropolis of the world? So how have we been able to do that? We were fortunate. Uh, that we had four bills that passed both the Assembly and Senate last year in our freshman year. Uh, and fortunately, three of them have been signed into law. Um, one of which uh, allows automatically, this did not exist in the state, um, that if someone was incarcerated, they automatic autopsy so you can understand what actually happened in the system. Because a lot of times, not enough transparency as it relates to what's going on in our criminal justice system, right? I think we can all agree on that. Uh, second, as it relates to our local governments, how they can have support if super storms occur again, so they can automatically get support. Uh, but the last one has been the one I'm the most passionate about, the one that I pretty much spent all of last year working on, which was there, current, there was a process where minority women-owned businesses that were contracting with the state would only get paid after 30 days, if not longer. Uh, we had a bipartisan bill that passed 149 to 1 in the Assembly, 63 to nothing in the Senate that as of December of this year is when it'll take full effect. 
that MWBs that are below 200 employees would get paid within 15 days, and there would have to be a written notification why you did not get paid immediately. Uh, this is a game changer. Uh, because we all know what happens often. You'll turn in your invoice, you are waiting to get paid, you'll, you will have to wait forever to get paid. And if you're not one of the larger companies, if you're a large company, you can handle that. But if you're a smaller company, if you don't get paid in two, three weeks, that's someone else's, that's somebody's paycheck. You know, you're not able to make sure that you're able to keep the lights on. And, and, and I said there was nothing else to me that had more impact than making that happen. Because if we want to really change the game for people of color and women in this country, we have to change the economic game. Uh, and, and that's how we create real parity in our communities. So we're excited that that bill has been signed. Uh, we've been elected to be second vice chair of the, the Black, Hispanic, and Asian Caucus. I would encourage everyone. Our major weekend, some people have been asking me how to get involved more. Uh, February 12th through the 14th is caucus weekend in Albany. Uh, it is the weekend where the most activity is happening. Uh, yes, I do understand February 14th is Valentine's Day. It's okay. You can find your boo in Albany. It'll be all right. You'll be, you'll, 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 you'll be just fine, just fine. Um, for, for those of you that are, uh, are, are another boo, I mean, I don't know what you got going, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not judging that, right? But, um, uh, but February 12th and 13th is when the workshops are collectively happening. The 14th, uh, we have our prayer breakfast, and then the, the gala is that night. Uh, where we're very excited that Donna Brazil, people obviously have heard Donna Brazil, oh, yeah. Donna Brazil is the keynote speaker um, on the 14th um, that night. Uh, so please let me know if you're interested in getting involved with what we're doing that weekend. Uh, you may not realize, remember I said 213 of us represent you in uh, Albany? Uh, now 50, 50 of us are people of color. It's powerful. Uh, it is powerful uh, right now. 47 women. Um, throughout the legislature. It's exciting to see. We have historic numbers that we're finally making progress on collectively and continue to make that move. Uh, if any of you are interested and available on January 23rd, two weeks from this Saturday, that will be our state of the district uh, where we'll lay out what our vision is for the rest of this year and where we're going forward. Uh, it will be January 23rd at 4 p.m. at Dream Yard uh, in the Bronx. And we picked that location specifically because it's one of the sites that was very tactical of hiring our communities and helping transform some things. We'll share that with everyone. Again, that's January 23rd at 4 p.m. Last two things, uh, and then I'm happy to open it up and, and we can do Q&A and everything like that collectively. Uh, I, I ran because I wanted to have impact. I didn't, I didn't run just to win a campaign. Uh, and I think a lot of times folks get involved um, for things for a job. This is not a job for me. This is my life. You know, uh, when you see these young brothers and sisters who feel like no one cares about them, no one's giving them a shot, no one's trying to do anything for them. Uh, this is why we spend so much time working so hard. So I was fortunate I'm co-chair of the Criminal Justice Task Force, and we talk about raise the age, where New York is one of the <coughs> two states in the country where 16 and 17 year olds can still get tried as adults. That matters to me because Khalif Browder was one of my constituents. And when his mom cries on our shoulder trying to figure out why was my son in solitary confinement at 16 and 17, something is wrong with that. We have to change that. we got to do better. When we're trying to figure out that how on earth we're still in the space that women are getting paid 77 cents to the dollar on a man in 2016, it does not make sense. And when you break that out even further, as women of color, you're talking about sometimes 61 cents, if not 53 cents. It makes no sense if we want to transform our communities. We have to do better. We have to keep working harder. If we want to change the game in our collective communities, it's about making sure that our communities get access to capital, access to contract, access to opportunity, and make sure you have access to bonding. And make sure that when people try to say, I can't find someone. I can't find a, an MWB. I can't find a quality business. Let's take that nonsense off the table and make sure that they can see you and respect you and you not only get the sub-sub. I don't want you on that. I want you to get the prime contracts. I want you to be able to help transform what's going on in our communities because when that happens, we can do some things. I want us to do better. I want you to see that we've been engaged in the African community from the start. I saw Charles Cooper uh, earlier. I was walking around um, collectively uh, itself, you know, you know, I shine my head just for you, Charles, just for you. You know, you know, got to make sure I, you, you can't be the only brother with the clean head and the goatee. I won't allow that, you know, itself. But, you know, you know Brother Cooper, who, as you all know, chairs the African Advisory Council uh, itself, uh, one of, was one of our chairs for our transition committee. We were very clear out the gate uh, that the African community is going to be a part of everything that we were doing. 
so when we came in immediately, we hired Roxanne Zuzu to make sure we were engaged in the community collectively. We partnered with African Advisory Council. When everything was happening around entrepreneurship and people were talking about what are we doing for entrepreneurship, we made sure to get immediate access to capital and partnered with SBA and the Advisory Council around that. We were playfully talking about the gender drink. The reason why we're talking about that is we've been talking about it in our offices of what are we going to do to make sure we get more access into our communities immediately. When everything was happening around the Ebola crisis and folks were trying to figure out how will we be engaged, we immediately partnered up and, and collaborated around Lincoln Hospital. This is not just going to be a one-time thing for us. This is, what, this is personal for me. This is personal for all of us. And I'll close with, with this. If you want to find a reason why you're engaged, I always encourage people to find your why. And what do I mean by that? Uh, in 2009, uh, there was an incident that happened, a beautiful incident at the White House um, that we didn't really tell many people about. When you're walking through the White House, photos usually come down every seven to ten days. There's one photo that the president himself has said will not come down. It's a photo of a little young boy named Jacob Philadelphia. Now, you have to know when you see the photo, you may not know the full story behind it. Jacob's father is a man named Carlton Philadelphia. Carlton has two sons, Jacob and Isaac. His, him and his wife were there in the Oval Office talking to the president because when you leave the White House, you get a chance to speak with the president one more time. So then Carlton says, Mr. President, both of my children have a question, but I don't know what the question would be. Now, if any of you have kids, you would be terrified at that moment right there. You have no idea where that's going to go at that exact particular moment. Isaac says, Mr. President, why'd you eliminate the F-22 fighter jet program? Which kind of messes you up that why on earth is a kid asking the leader of the free world about some kind of question about that? But he said, well, because it costs too much. But Jacob's question is the one that resonates. Jacob's question is the why. Why I come to you tonight, why you're here tonight, why we have more work to do. Jacob started to say, Mr. President, I just got a new suit. Okay, okay. And, um, Mr. President, I, um, I just got a haircut. Okay. And then five-year-old Jacob started to slowly stretch out his hand in the old office. And he said, um, Mr. President, I was wondering if I could, um, if I could touch your head and know if it feels like mine. So he first said, it, and the president said, wait, say that again. And he said, I was wondering if I could touch your hair to know if it feels like mine. So then he got nervous, and the president said, touch it, dude, just touch it. And he, he touched it, and he said, what do you think? He says, yeah, it, 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 it feels like mine. For me, it's my nephew, Dwight. For you, it could be a son, a daughter, a, a grandson, a, a, a goddaughter, whomever it may be. But find your why. Why do you wake up every morning? Why do you go to work? Why are you engaged in trying to change the game and transform lives. For me, that's what politics is supposed to be. It's not this nonsense about birth certificates and where folks were at. You know, it's not that. It's that there are black kids that are getting shot who are doing absolutely nothing. Going through the streets of New York and Chicago, South Carolina, wherever it may be. It's folks that are just trying to get a job. If you are working, you should not be poor. The countless number of folks who, are, who have jobs and are still homeless. That's why we find your why. So I say thank you. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for believing in what we're trying to do and how we're building a better Bronx. Thank you for believing in this vision. I'm asking for you to continue to believe in this vision and continue to make sure not just that we get reelected this year. It's not just about a campaign. It's about how do we change the game so that kids can have a chance every single day. God bless you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
So I understand there's supposed to be some appeals uh, and also some Q&A that may also happen. Uh, I, I'm just going to say this. Uh, first, uh, Rafi, Jeff, Rafi, Ray, 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 Rafi is my, my finance director here. Uh, you know, it, you know, we all know as, as you know, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it big. We grabbed Rafi. Rafi was a national fundraiser and decided to jump on board to help us as well. So we're grateful for him. The, the reason why we're doing this tonight, uh, so that everyone is aware, uh, Monday uh, is the next fundraising deadline for all of us in the state and the city. Uh, so all the, the new reports will go out by next Friday so people know what people have raised collectively. Uh, it is our hope that not only we'll win our race, but also uh, we want to be helpful to make, take back the state Senate uh, right now. Don't break Denny's house now. You know, know what I mean? You know, I, I, I'm just saying, don't, don't. I'm just saying. You're not, I'm saying, you're not going to take our checks to be fixing something around here right now. You know, we worked hard for, no, I'm just playing. All right, you know. Uh, it's so, all right. You know, exactly. We ain't going to do that. Uh, so that's why we're doing tonight uh, for folks to be aware. It's your, yourself. People usually ask us. You can. There are options. You can give uh, out of your individual funds or you can give out of your corporate funds. Uh, some people like to do the latter because it's actually easier for them. We understand that completely. Uh, the max is 5,000 corporate. The max is 4,100 individual uh, itself. Uh, and then lastly, because I know folks usually ask, and that's starting some of the conversations, uh, about the presidential elections uh, and what's all collectively going on. Uh, I, I was not joking when I said don't st stop sl sleeping on Trump. Like, there's just the advice we were always told on every campaign is that a campaign at the end of the day is who has the biggest list. Like, that's all that it is, right? It's, that's all that really matters. Donald Trump's been in first place for about seven months. Period. <laughs> like, I just, I, I just don't understand why people would be surprised anymore about this. And when you look at, since President Obama's been in office, that a Tea Party was created purely because of racism, let's just be real about that, right? Yes. And then you have someone in Eric Cantor who was the number two in the House who was up 20 points that morning who could lose to someone who admitted that not only he wasn't really campaigning, he didn't think he was going to win because of what's happening collectively in that, that, that movement that's there right now. Now, when you look at polls, I would encourage you, it's important to look at a poll to find to see at the bottom, are they likely voters or registered voters? That's a dramatic difference, right? And these national polls don't mean anything right now. I would focus on the state polls itself. So when you're looking at the state polls, when you're trying to really assess what's actually happening, so for example, there was a new New Hampshire poll today that had uh, Trump at 29, and then had, there was someone at 15. It wasn't Cruz, no, I think Cruz was, Cruz was further down. There's someone at 15, I can't remember, it's not Christy. Someone's at 15 in the new New Hampshire poll. Rubio, it was Rubio that's at 15, that's right. And then Christy's at 11. So when you look at the bottom, when it says margin of error, you know, all that's meaning is when you see those numbers, you should assume that that number is that number that you're seeing higher or lower. So if you see margin of error and it says plus or minus four, that means that Rubio is at 15 or he's at 19 or 11. That's the way you should be looking when you're seeing these polls collectively. So why am I saying that? If you're seeing margin of error is plus or minus three or four, and you're seeing that Donald Trump is still ahead on top of margin of error, you need to stop sleeping on someone. Because that means I'm winning no matter how bad this poll could be. <laughs> Period. That's what that practically is trying to tell you right there. You know, the reason why we knew we were going to win both elections is because this campaign's come down to 10 election states, pretty much battleground states. A Democrat in a general election pretty much starts around 222, 232, give or take. So we knew we only needed to win three of the 10 battleground states. Because how many states you start with? Like we start with New York. You have California, you have Illinois, larger states we already know Dems have. So we already knew we just needed to get there. In the first election, we had 11 paths to victory. In the second election, we had 42 paths to victory. Barack Obama was going to be president. The numbers were just there. Hillary Clinton, more than likely, is going to be the president, just because how the numbers shape up. However, 
the relevance of all of this year is here in New York, remember, I'm going back to where I started about the 150 and the 63 for the state Senate. In the state Senate in New York, we have a supermajority in the Assembly. Democrats, we have 106 seats right now, overwhelmingly Democrat. In the Senate, though, there are 25 Democrats that are there. There are five independent Democrats, and there are 31 Republicans right now. However, every presidential election, Democrats take back a lot more seats in the state Senate. And when you think that Hillary Clinton is at the top, forgive me, Secretary Clinton, I'm going to give her the respect that's due. Secretary Clinton's at the top of the ticket more than likely. We expect New York turnout will be higher. April 19th is an important day because April 19th is the New York presidential primary here. However, April 19th will probably also be the day of special elections for the Shelley Silver seat in lower Manhattan uh, itself. And then out in Long Island, the Skello seat uh, itself. Again, this is relevant because Long Island has nine seats that are held by the Republicans right now. So all of these things are happening collectively that you should be aware of and paying attention to. That you have four elections you need to vote in this year in New York. Okay? You have a congressional a race in June. You have a presidential race in April. You have a state primary in September, and then you have a general election in November. Okay? So just make sure you're involved in that way, and that is important for me to share. Uh, if folks have other questions or anything like that, happy to talk them through uh, it's, itself. Hmm? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, itself. All right. Uh, Danny? Uh, I I am the uh, Senior Public Relations Officer for Go Africa Network. I also am a com communications person for Miss Guinea USA, uh, a nonprofit organization that empowers young Guinean women. I am here today with um, Kadia Tufadiga, who is Miss Guinea USA 2011, and State Assemblyman Michael Blake at his uh, fundraiser for his re-election campaign. Thank you both for being here with us. Thank you. Um, and so, first of all, we're, we're honored to be speaking with you today. Um, we, first, we just wanted to know, um, how has how's the night been? Um, how are you feeling about your uh, upcoming election? And what are you hoping to accomplish? And how was the fundraiser tonight? It's been uh, in incredibly exciting. You know, any, any time you can see people support your vision, it's, it's very helpful. And, you know, we're just continuing to build. You know, we've, we've been very focused on this vision of 321. Um, of how do we have economic development, education, equality for all, how do we help our minority women-owned businesses and focus on education, uh, how do we make it the urban metropolis. And so our collective vision in empowering the African community was on display tonight. When you have the, the turnout that we did tonight, uh, the excitement, the jokes, the smiles, the energy, uh, it, it shows that we're building something special in the South Bronx uh, and, and being really focused on African entrepreneurship, you know, what are we doing around trade, how are we helping our young students who want to get involved in these different opportunities, you know, being responsive in times of need. Uh, all, all of that is on display in what we're building in the South Bronx. So uh, an, a, an amazing night uh, and, and hopefully the continuation of an amazing year as we get ready for re-election. That's great. Thank you. And we were wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing in the African community. You had mentioned when you were speaking during the fundraiser that you work with the Bronx Borough President's African Advisory Council. So tell us a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing in that community. You know, the, the first Thursday of the month, uh, the leadership of the Borough President, Ruben Diaz Jr. in the Bronx, uh, pulled together the African Advisory Council chaired by Charles Cooper, who uh, uh, Charles was uh, one of our transition co-chairs of engaging the community and just being aware of what the different opportunities would be and saying we're not just going to meet, but we're going to stay active. Uh, so as it relates to our entrepreneurship meetings, uh, when we brought SBA leadership uh, to the Bronx to sit and talk about how do we have international opportunities, when we did conference calls and meetings with the Minority Business Development Agency and saying how do we expand out what's going on in West Africa to, to us here, because we have the largest West African population outside of West Africa in the world, uh, when the Ebola crisis happened. How do we have immediate responsiveness with the community and engagement with Lincoln Hospital and other entities? 
So whether it be during crisis or everyday livelihood, uh, we're demonstrating we're serious about being engaged with the African community. Uh, we, we hired an African staffer, we have an African leadership in our transition, uh, and staying engaged in that way. Uh, and when we think about how the Bronx is the most diverse county in the country, uh, that we have to be very serious and be very diligent about that. Uh, and, 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 it, and it shows. You know, people know when you're serious about their community. They, they know when you are beyond just lip service and you're actually wanting to listen and learn and engage. Uh, and for me, you know, as someone who comes from a Jamaican background, you know, the immigrant experience is relevant for all of us collectively. People just want to have a chance to have a good life. They want a chance for a good school. They want to be able to have a job. They want to have a good home. Uh, and so it's our responsibility and my responsibility especially, uh, given the community that we represent, to make sure that we're doing that. And also, you had spoken also about um, your, um, you seem to have a really strong focus on increasing the number of minority and women-owned businesses um, in New York, in the U.S., and, you know, that's something that hits close to home for us at Miss Guinea USA. Um, so just to give you a sense of what we do, we have a pageant that we host every year. We feature eight college-aged uh, young Guinean girls, and they all come up with a platform, an issue they want to tackle in Guinea. And you know, we, you know, there's also a talent portion. We have an empowerment week where the girls meet with um, political leaders, community leaders, like the uh, permanent representative of Guinea to the United Nations. They even met with Bronx Councilwoman uh, Vanessa Gibson to talk about leadership. The winner travels to Guinea. She, um, you know, she meets with community leaders, political leaders. She goes to visit a school in a village, gives school supplies and everything. So, you know, we'd like to know more about how, how you're empowering young women, especially young women of color. Absolutely. When you think about the, the, the importance of minority women-owned business, it's not just about someone having a job, it's about a community being compensated. Uh, and how do you transform that community? When you think about the pay equity gaps that still exist in our country and our world, uh, for me, that gets transformed by making sure that someone not only has a job, but they are able to have a career and expand from that. So whether it be our work with WEEN, Women in Entertainment Empowerment Network, uh, by engaging with them and saying, how do we pull in our young women of color so they can understand that we want you to be running the business. We want you to be in positions of leadership. We want to make sure that there's growth and acceleration that happens there. From introducing them to people like Alejandro Castillo so that they can see that there is a woman of color that runs the National Minority Business Development Agency so that you can realize your dreams no matter what those dreams may be collectively. Uh, that's how we're demonstrating that in collaboration. And so our piece of legislation that was signed into law uh, which would speed up the payment times for minority women-owned businesses from 30 days to 15 days. That's a game changer uh, for, for people of color, for women entrepreneurs who are consistently wondering if they're going to get paid on time and are figuring out how do I make ends meet. You know that, you know, I can pursue my dream. I can realize my dream. I can not be afraid of what might be happening because I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to turn my information. I'm going to get paid on time and I can help pay the people in my community. Uh, that's how we change the game. Uh, so when we think about how it's, it's inexcusable that it's 77 cents for, uh, on the dollar to a woman to a man, and when women of color, anyone can say it goes all the way down to 51 cents, the way we change that is by changing economic development uh, and making sure that you're not just dependent on someone else hiring you, but that you can able to start your own business, grow your own business, hire people in our community. Uh, that's how you change what's happening with our, our women of color and empowering them in that way. You look at our leadership. Uh, our incoming chief of staff, a woman of color, Brittany Whaley. Uh, we're demonstrating that we're serious about this. Uh, the co-chairs of my transition, uh, Sabrina Filson from, from Epsilon Advisors, uh, Michelle DePass, who runs uh, the Dean of Policy at the New School. Uh, I, I'm committed to this, you know, and, and you, you demonstrate how your seriousness by your actions. Uh, and, and people will continue to see that women will be empowered by what we're building in our office. Women of color are going to get opportunities by what we're building. And, and that we are going to be transforming the community in a way that they have not seen before. And we'd like to know more about your thoughts on the current presidential campaign. Um, you know, you kind of talked about it a little bit. You gave a nice um, explanation of how to read polls. Very interesting. I, I was thinking about it too, you know, like thinking about the margin of error and, and all of that. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what your predictions are and what you've been thinking about all that. You know, I'm a, I'm a supporter of Secretary Clinton. I was. Uh, uh, the, the earliest supporter in the Bronx for her uh, publicly uh, itself. I, I believe she will be the next president. I really do believe that. Uh, you look at what's happening on the Republican side, I think they're going to have a very engaged primary. Uh, I, I, it looks like that either Trump or Cruz will probably win Iowa. Uh, I think Trump is going to win New Hampshire. Uh, and then what really happens, Nevada is up in the air. It's unclear what happens there. 
but the, the March 1st date is a critical date. That SEC primary, those southern states, uh, very deep evangelical states on the Republican primary, uh, what happens there itself. Uh, I think we cannot ignore the fact that in any other election, if someone was in first place for six months, you would presume that person is going to win. And so I think us having these conversations now of thinking that Trump is not a serious candidate it is laughable. We can, you can't do that any longer. You know, we are going into the second week of January, uh, and he has been in the lead since last summer. So unless something you know really surprising occurs, I, I don't think it's impossible at all he's, he's the not, that he's not the nominee. Uh, I think what we need to look at are a few things. In New Hampshire, who's that establishment candidate that comes out of there? You know, Kasich, uh, Bush, Christie, Rubio, they're all kind of the same kind of candidate. You know, so when all that noise quiets down and then it's Trump, Cruz, and then that, that kind of candidate, uh, that's when the race really gets going for them. And, and the, the, what they have to decide is the people in the Republican base are really excited by what Trump is saying. You know, there's a connection that's happening there. Can the rest of the party decide they're going to get behind somebody else? That's the only way you're stopping that train uh, itself. But I think it doesn't matter in the general election. Uh, I think that what you're going to see happen is what happened in 2012 a lot of ways. They're, they're saying things already that you can't back away from, right? You know, you're looking at the Republican nominee, they are saying things that are showing that they don't have respect for women, they don't have respect for Mexicans, they don't have respect for people of color, they don't have respect for low-income communities. They're, 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 this is what they're articulating itself. Uh, and so you can't walk back from that. Uh, and, and, and I think for those reasons and because of her superb qualifications, because uh, she is qualified, uh, that Secretary Clinton will be president um, after a very intense primary, what we see on the Republican side. Is there anything else you want to share with us about uh, any other issues that you'd like to focus on if we elected or anything? I, I want everyone to come out to our state of the district. Uh, if you're here in the, in the states and here in the Bronx, January 23rd, uh, 4 p.m., January 23rd, 4 p.m. at Dream Yard, 1085 Washington Avenue in the Bronx. Uh, come visit us in Albany. Uh, we're always engaged in Albany January to June um, during the caucus season, especially February 12th through the 14th where Donna Brazil is the keynote speaker at the, at the gala on February 14th. Uh, but I just want you to build with us. We're building something special right now. Uh, so MR Mike Blake, that's the Twitter handle. We want a lot of followers on Twitter. We're past 10,000 already, so we want to keep that going. Uh, Instagram, Mike Blake 1922 uh, But we're, we're, we're doing something special. Uh, so hashtag building a better Bronx. Uh, this is what we're trying to do. You know, this, is, uh, this is home for me. And uh, I, I really want people to see that when you do it the right way, things can happen. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I'm a senior PR officer for Go Africa Network. I'm also a communications uh, director slash um, person for Miss Guinea USA. It's a nonprofit organization that empowers young Guinean women. Um, I am here today with Aubrey Lynch. Um, he is the director of dance at the Harlem School of the Arts. And um, yeah, so thank you so much for coming to the fundraiser. Um, so yeah, first I just, immediate impressions. How did you enjoy the fundraiser um, for State Assemblyman Michael Blake? Um, he, he evoked a lot of really uh, powerful messages that seemed to resonate well with the um, audience. So tell me, what brought you here tonight? Uh, what are your thoughts? Yes, well, I really can appreciate what he's saying, and I'm a, I'm a big fan because whenever you can bring people together um, around a common goal, it's a powerful thing. And to hear him speak live was very, very powerful for me. I was a dancer with the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, and I was an original cast member of Disney's The Lion King on Broadway. And now I teach kids at the Harlem School of the Arts. And what he's talking about is being aware of your environment and be aware of the power you have to change your community is what I do every day with the kids. And I do it through dance and theater and the arts. And so they're not always aware of the real reality of what's happening in our world, but they're impacted by it. They hear the television, they see it on Facebook, and they hear their parents talk about it. So I try to give them tools to, to know who they are and to be empowered so that they have imagination and creativity to change their, their circumstance. Because a child in the arts sometimes is the difference between life and death. 
sometimes you feel like you can't control your environment, you can't control your circumstances. But when you take a dance class or paint or, or do poetry and sing and dance, then you feel like you're bigger than life, that you can dream and imagine a world outside of your circumstances and they can become our future leaders. So it's, it was really powerful to hear him speak and to be reaffirmed that I'm actually doing my share. Great, that's great. Um, I can tell that you're very inspired by State Assemblyman Blake. Um, yeah, and so uh, what, do you, what do you feel are the issues that are most important to you? Um, what do you look for in an elected official and somebody who engages in public service? Well, I look for a leader that is aware of one, where they come from, and, and where the people that are doing the hard work are. If you have money in this world, let's face it, you're good, you're good. If you don't have access to money and or resources or people with resources or money, then it's hard to imagine being anywhere but where you are. And for children, we all deserve a good education. We deserve to have arts as a part of our education. And so I want a leader that is going to let people be who they are and to hear what to, to help inspire young businesses, to help inspire um, young leaders, and to be role models for, for our children. Um, I'm in the, in the studio every day with kids, and they really want to um, feel like they're seen, and they're heard, and they have a voice. And so I want a leader that, first of all, sees who I am. I mean, I kind of fall through the cracks. I'm not rich, I'm not poor, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle, and I want a leader that's going to um, understand what my personal um, uh, wishes are, and therefore that trickles down to my kids. And I think that um, Michael, uh, Michael Blake is certainly <laughs> one of those people. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to share with us about your thoughts on the fundraiser and how you're feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling good. I have my own organization called Aubrey Lynch Extra Essential Arts, and I trademark the phrase, uh, the arts aren't extracurricular, they're extra essential. Because the arts are essential. The arts are um, make us who we are, and without the arts, we're not complete human beings. So I'm looking for leaders, and young leaders, not just Michael Blake, but other leaders that are going to stand up and fight for the arts, and um, fight for a good, solid education so that we can be who we are, so that we can stand in our shoes and know that we are powerful and worthy and beautiful people that are ready to take on the world and lead us to a better place. Great. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. <laughs> I'm still matching. I'm still matching. Dr. Jones is still matching. Come on, come on. So let's. Somebody else. I'm thinking. Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. That's up for the road. That's up for the road. I'll say this. Wait, wait, wait. Video camera off. Video camera off. Oh, fuck the camera. I knew the time. Now the time for that money to come in.